Welcome to today's webinar, Introduction to the Whole Child Initiative and Social Emotional Learning, brought to you by Simple K-12. My name is Lori, and I'm here with Cheryl Harmer, and we are so excited to have all of you here with us today. Now, this webinar is brought to you free today thanks to our sponsor, Apperson. At Apperson, our mission is to maximize potential. We advance educational professional development by providing innovative services and solutions designed to assess performance and measure success. We deliver exceptional customer service, driven driven by our core values of integrity, passion, respect, and teamwork. Now, this results in greater knowledge and enriched outcomes for students, teachers, and business leaders alike. Now, for those of you who are joining in live, I just went ahead and sent out a tweet from our Twitter account. You can feel free to retweet to your followers and invite them to attend today's session that is free and open to the public. Thanks to our friends at Apperson. Just be sure to include this link as well as that hashtag SK12 when you send out your tweet. Once again, we do have that live back channel chat open. Great place for you all as attendees. You can take notes and chat with one another. I went ahead and shared that link out through the chat area of GoToWebinar, and I'll go ahead and resend that again in just a couple of moments. Now, we will have some time for some live Q&A at the end of our session today with Cheryl. Um, feel free to submit your questions through that questions box of GoToWebinar. If you submit your question through the Titan pad, I may not see it. So if you have a question about the teacher learning community or you have a technical question, I can help you with that behind the scenes during the webinar today. Otherwise, if you do have a question for Cheryl, we will have some time for some live Q&A at the end of our session. Now, a little bit about our presenter, Dr. Cheryl Harmer. She holds a doctorate in educational leadership and policy studies and superintendent certification from the University of Washington. Now, she has over 30 years of experience as an elementary principal, a K-12 teacher, a learning specialist, and a community college instructor. Now, following her public school career, Cheryl was also the director of program development at Committee for Children, and was also the recipient of the 1998 NAESP National Distinguished Principal of the Year Award for Washington State. Cheryl, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Lori. I'm very happy to, to join you today and to join everybody who's listening in. Wonderful. And I just went ahead and passed the screen to you. And your screen looks great. We're good to go. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. I want to very much thank you for joining us today. And again, thanks to Lori. Um, I'm really looking forward to this time with everyone. Um, I, Lori introduced me as an educator of 30 years. Actually, I've been in education for 40 years, and during that time I've seen many changes, um, many movements and transformations and really the greatest, latest new things coming and going. But for the last 15 years since I left the schoolhouse as a principal, I've really devoted my interests and energy to understanding um, the, uh, the power of social and emotional learning. To me, this is the single most important step you can take as an educator, finding a way, large or small, to begin to really understand how you can bring social and emotional learning um, into your classroom, into your school-wide approach, and it really is the foundation for beginning to address our complex needs that we know that the, uh, that the whole child really has. So I invite you to come with Paul and me over the next four sessions as we share with you both some high-level conceptual understanding and some concrete ideas that we hope will inform and inspire you. So today we're offering four webinars that will build upon and complement each other. Um, I'm going to give you an uh, overview of social and emotional learning and how it supports the whole child. Paul will then present the DESA system for evaluating social and emotional learning co com competencies and tell you about measurement and why that's so important. And then he'll also discuss how you can promote student learning through social and emotional learning. And finally, as Lori says, I'm going to wrap up this afternoon with reviewing the importance of adult resistant, resilience, excuse me, and how you take a school-wide approach to social and emotional learning. Um, we have some goals for this particular session. Let me get, see if that can go right. Um, so I'm going to start in this session by really providing an overview of the whole child and social and emotional learning. I want to give you an idea of why it, there's a need today in, in uh, 
our schools for social and emotional learning and how the schools that are adopting it and, this, and the teachers who are really understanding it and implementing it in their classroom are really making a difference. There is a link between social and emotional learning, resilience and learning, which I'll touch on briefly, and hopefully I can give you some ideas of uh, what you can do about it and where you can start. So why does all this matter? Um, I think I'd like to start with a story. When I think about why this matters, I only have to go into my own memories of being a school principal and I have to think about Scott. Um, I want to tell you about Scott. Scott was one of those kids. He lived about a block from the school. He was a small fifth grader from a troubled family. He was mostly cared for by his older brother, came to school dirty, mostly was uh, bullied others, he was highly emotional, he struggled academically, and we suspected he may have been the one to set the dumpster on fire one weekend. So what to do about Scott? Thankfully, Scott had a caring and smart teacher who saw beneath all his bravado to his pain. And over the course of several months, we all took Scott under our wing. We gave him clean shirts to wear and made sure he had breakfast. Um, he gradually learned to recognize when he was about to lose control and we gave him a safe place to calm down. And the important thing we did in addition to all this is we assigned him as a morning partner to the custodian who was able to channel his hunger for interaction and his lack of self-confidence that was really at the root of his bullying. Scott became the clean coffee cup distributor, delivering teachers clean coffee cups each morning before school. And every morning he came early, changed into a clean shirt and rolled around the cart of coffee mugs. A quick greeting, some good natured teasing, gentle encouragement greeted him at every door. So you can imagine, before long, he was giving the affirmations back. It was about learning how to connect and how to develop relationships. And he also developed a sense of self-efficacy and optimism. And before the year was over, uh, Scott no longer needed to bully others. Um, he began to develop his drawing talents, and school became a place he really wanted to be. We think he began to realize he mattered, and we, he learned some, school, some skills that were really leading him through um, some transformational pieces. And most importantly, uh, reading and academic achievement became really important to him. Reading on grade level became a goal he set and worked really hard to achieve. So I assume you're taking part in this webinar because you're a teacher, a counselor, another specialist in the school, or administrator, or even an out-of-school time provider, or maybe a parent. And in any of those roles, I assume that you are mostly here because you care about kids today. Um, so it's what we do in the classroom, as we all know, that makes such a difference. It's about balancing our, feet, our focus, and um, that's what we're going to talk about, how you can enhance your role and improve outcomes for, for children in your classroom and across the school. So let's talk a little bit about what the need is. There are some major studies, in fact, one major study that's been cited of 100 and, nearly 150,000 middle school and U.S. and high school students um, gave some startling statistics, but unfortunately, these really aren't new, are they? I think we've seen statistics like this. They're troubling. Um, we realize that working with others and knowing one's strengths and where we need to rely on others, having empathy or making good decisions and being able to resolve conflict you know, productively are really critical to success. And we also know that learning requires the confidence to set a goal and to route your path. And that conf confidence often comes, as it did from Scott, to be, from being in a caring, encouraging, and learning environment. So um, we believe that students can, can't learn unless they're engaged in school and unless they're disengaged from the kinds of high-risk behaviors that can derail our best intentions. So these are skills that, as caring uh, educators, we can all teach. Um, if they're just as critical, if not more so, I believe, than content and technical knowledge. So it's about balance, and it's about um, finding a place to start. Oftentimes, that's really kind of the problem. We understand in our heart this is what we want to do, but we are overwhelmed or don't know where to start. So hopefully this series of webinars will get you started. Um, these are terms that a lot of us are familiar with. If you're reading the literature, if you're paying attention to uh, news 
articles. Um, everyone in education and beyond is aware that schools um, and, and, and what we teach is really being redefined. Um, you just have to listen to the language we hear about all these new skills that we need to pay attention to. Grit and tenacity, uh, character education, conflict resolution, interpersonal skills, bullying prevention, 21st century skills, whole child. Some of them have called them soft skills, others call them skills for success. But overall, in aggregate, they really signal um, a shifting paradigm of how we look at the whole child, how we look at the heart as well as the head. All of these terms really can be both confusing and overwhelming if we think about adding one more thing that schools are being asked to take on. But I believe these terms describe a movement toward balance, a recognition that academic achievement requires more than content competence. And what we are now understanding more clearly is how to foster these kinds of skills as an integrated part of every school day. The good news, I believe, is that we're at a tipping point for a significant shift in how we define the function of education. So when we talk about the whole child, let's take a minute and see what do we actually mean by that. When we talk about educating the whole child, it's shifting that focus on academic achievement through content mastery to a balanced approach that really promotes school success and preparation for lifelong learning. The Association of Supervision and Curriculum Development, ASCD, has developed an initiative called the Whole Child Initiative. And um, they have described six areas that are really important, they feel, for advancing. And I applaud them for all the work that they are doing. Um, promoting health for students, physical and emotional safety, engagement and connectedness for students, and access to learning that meets personal, personal learning goals, and academic challenge, and ultimately preparation for lifelong learning. Um, it's uh, really important, I think, for them to advance this in a broad kind of a way. And our feeling is that the foundation that they're talking about really is uh, the foundation of social and emotional learning that is the umbrella that covers all of these concepts that they're striving for. So we're very much in concert with the efforts to address the whole child, and today I'd like to chat with you in a deeper way about social and emotional learning and the whole child, how it all fits together. Some people believe that social and emotional skills are things that children just kind of pick up as we get older. But the literature is clearly indicating that these skills that we call social and emotional learning are both teachable and measurable. We can be intentional about promoting them. Um, it's not something that just has to happen. It certainly is great when it's supported by the whole system, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But it turns out that when we look at the research, social and emotional competence is really at the heart of all learning, including academic achievement. So let's define what social and emotional learning really is. CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, uh, is an organization that's been around for over 20 years. And they were established to um, really advance the science and the practice of social and emotional learning. And they have done so in some very remarkable ways. CASEL defines social and emotional learning, or SEL, as we shorten, shorthand it, as the process of acquiring, applying the necessary knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, and skills for success in school and life. There are five domains, really, and I'm going to briefly touch on those. There are two that relate to the self, kind of looking at the intrapersonal. Uh, recognizing your own emotions, values, and strengths through self-awareness, and also learning coping strategies for regulating emotions and managing self-discipline. Then there's another cluster that have to do with social skills, um, inter interpersonal skills, working with others. And these are foundational skills um, really to developing empathy for others, to be able to see things from another person's point of view. Um, 
learning in school ultimately is a social process and it's dependent upon a person's ability to form and maintain personal relationships, positive relationships, and to communicate effectively. So we can teach those skills. And finally, there's a domain, the fifth domain, is uh, about applying those skills. Responsible decision making is how they uh, term this walk, and it's application of those. Um, at the ability to make a plan and to think optimistically, to carry out a plan, to consider you know, alternatives and good choices in solving problems. We oftentimes call this executive function, but this is definitely an essential element in successful learning as li and living, as you can imagine. Many states actually have recognized the importance of these skills as a foundation for learning and have developed state standards. Illinois is probably the leader in this, and I just want to give you an example of the kinds of uh, competencies that Illinois has set uh, uh, that would give you a little deeper idea of how developmentally some of these skills play out. And of course, they have developed um, a developmental continuum from kindergarten through 12th grade that touch on all of those five areas uh, that I've just described in the CASEL framework. And you can see how in terms of one uh, descriptor area, identifying and managing one's emotions and behavior, which has to do with self-awareness as well as self-management. At grades one and two, it looks very differently, identifying emotions and in integrated into uh, academic achievement or academic content, naming the emotions that are felt by characters and stories, uh, describing a time you felt the same way a story character felt. You can see how it evolves uh, in the older grades. Uh, five, six, and seven, the same strand, and it gets more complex. Describe strategies for dealing with upsetting situations, as an example. And then when you get to grades 12, 11 and 12, they have evolved it to describing how changing your interpretation of an event can alter how you and others feel about it. Um, they have many more of these. These are just examples, and I encourage you to go to their website, Illinois State Standards or Illinois SEL Standards, and you can really uh, get a chance to see how well fleshed out these are, and I think it gives you some ideas on how to bring that forward in a deeper way. So I'd like to talk to you for just a minute about brain, brain research. <laughs> it's funny we don't talk much about the brain as we're discussing learning. As uh, neuroscience has begun to reveal, there's also a biological basis why SEL matters. And just the, the quick cliff notes on this is that there are two regions of our brain that are critical to learning, the amygdala and the hippocampus. The amygdala is our reaction center. It responds to strong emotions and emotional distress. And it, it does that by signaling uh, for the release of stress hormones, cortisol and other stress hormones. And the hippocampus is our central organ for memory. Um, Everything we learn, everything we read, everything we understand uh, counts on the hippocampus to function correctly. The problem is, under great stress, the amygdala gets flooded with cortisone, and it, that impairs the hippocampus because it forces our attention, our mental attention, onto the emotions we're feeling, and it restricts our ability to take in new information. So, um, what we found is that if this flooding of cortisol occurs over a long period of time, um, it can really impair actually uh, the, the, the ability to learn. So self-regulation is critical for learning and that's one of the main areas or a big area of uh, skill development in social and emotional learning. I also want to take a minute and look at resilience because resilience is an area that we hear a lot about. We know it's important to be able to bounce back. It's the capacity really to withstand stress or bad things that happen to you, challenges. And being resilient doesn't mean you don't have those kinds of stressors, but it does mean that you know what to do with them and you, can, you have the positive protective factors that can support you, such as self-management, self-awareness, so that if you're uh, in a stressful situation, you don't have to um, rely on your default, uh, where you're at in terms of times of, that you might be at risk, where there's high emotional stress, or perhaps a, a someone who has um, 
high emotional, excuse me, antisocial beliefs or attitudes. There's also peer and social risk and protective factors that are related to resilience. It's not something that you're either born with or not. Resilience develops as people grow up and they gain better thinking and self-management skills and actually more knowledge. So building resilience, both as adults and as children, is a core uh, competency that we can influence and that really uh, spells success or not over a lifetime of an individual. So I would like to say, though, that all this talk about stress and about challenging kids, et cetera, um, may lead you to believe that social emotional learning is simply for kids uh, with problems, and it's really not. Social and emotional learning uh, is about competencies that are necessary for success in learning and life. It's necessary for all of us to be able to see things from a different points of view, to have empathy, to appreciate differences, to have an optimistic outlook and a growth mindset, um, to be able to self-regulate, to set goals, to plan and evaluate, to think logically about if I do this, then what might happen, um, to work well with others, and to have sort of an open, healthy curiosity about um, the possibilities that one could engage in. These are all competencies that everyone needs, and that's why social and emotional learning really needs to be from a universal perspective. Taking a look at this framework, this gives you a broad framework. This was developed by the Social Policy Report, and if you Google that, you want it to read deeper. It's in volume 26, number four on page five, but the whole, the whole report is a good report. And what it does is create this visual framework that says if we're going to do social and emotional learning, we really have to look at it from a whole system perspective, beginning with the teacher and their background, their social and emotional competence, moving to the classroom and the classroom context that's, that's set, whether it's healthy relationships, offering instructional support, and effective classroom management. And then um, the important thing is that there are intentional ways, as I've said, for effective skill uh, instruction. Looking at evidence-based programs and really um, implementing them the way they're written is an important piece. When you do all this, you come to, and when you have the support of your community, you come, science is clear, that we come to some really great um, outcomes for kids. There are shorter term outcomes that have been measured that I'll tell you about in a few minutes and longer term outcomes. Essentially, this framework is what we're talking about supporting. How do we look at what we're doing in social emotional learning from a systems perspective and how do we support it? Um, in the later, in my last um, presentation this afternoon, I will be going deeper into that whole system approach and giving you ideas about how you can actually design and implement a whole systems approach. For right now, I want to mention that the evidence-based programs that were shown on the left side of your screen in your first, um, the, in, the, in the last screen right there, um, are really uh, the programs that are out there that have been tested that show that they um, have good results. These are only some examples. Um, the important thing to know about looking at all evidence-based curriculums that you are trying to decide what's right for you is to review what's right for you in your school. And that means you need good information to be able to say, what are the needs of my kids? What are the needs of my classroom right now? And perhaps if you're an administrator, what are the needs of their school or as a district to make a choice amongst many uh, really great evidence-based programs. So I encourage you to do that. What we want is to add a deeper layer to all of that universal approach. We think the development of social and emotional skills, attitudes and behaviors that is informed by sound data is critically important. It needs to, we need to have good baseline understanding of where our kids are, where their strengths are, where their needs are, and then we need to use that information and integrate um, that information into our program design. We need ways to monitor the progress of kids based on the program that we've designed, and we need to be able to adjust and um, kind of formative 
progress approach in terms of how do we really understand in the moment instead of waiting till the end about how kids are doing with all the efforts that we're putting forward. And again, Paul's going to tell you a bit about, um, uh, quite a bit about our wonderful tool that we offer to you for that data. Uh, what we're talking about is designing measurement, purpose, and prog process that's changed that we makes our uh, processes that we put forward uh, that are informed by data and that really gives us the purpose behind our, our decisions that we make in the classroom versus being assessed for accountability, which has been too much, too often the case. When we do this, we can, do, we can find a multi-tiered approach to support all kids. So at the universal level, you're going to have an evidence-based program. But if you have greater, greater information, you can form small groups or you can target individual kids with individual needs. Forming this multi-tiered approach is critical to creating this, this deep, deep um, experience around social emotional learning as you're teaching all of those social skills. We have great evidence that shows that if you do this, if you implement evidence-based programs in the way that they're designed, there is scientific evidence that shows there is a 9% improvement in attitudes about self in school. There's a 23% improvement in social and emotional skills, a 9% improvement in classroom behavior, and this is a very important statistic. It was demonstrated in this great study, 213 uh, it was a meta-analysis of 213 studies involving over 200, 270,000 kids in K-12 that there was an 11% improvement in achievement test scores when there was an intentional focus on these social and emotional learning skills. There's also, of course, a decrease in conduct problems and a decrease in emotional stress, uh, such as depression. So social and emotional learning absolutely makes a difference. Teaching these skills intentionally does make a difference. It matters greatly to be able to reach the um, optimum academic learning and life success that we all want for our kids. Um, we can develop social and emotional skills, as you've seen through the standards, across all ages and stages. And um, we need to make sure that all kids are exposed to it and have a deep understanding of it so that you can have that context for all kids to be successful in, even if you're targeting kids that may need a little extra boost. So the final piece is that social and emotional skills can be measured and monitored. Often, for a long time, we didn't realize that there's a way to really measure and monitor and track growth for, uh, for our own understanding about progress that's being made. Paul's going to tell you in our next webinar about a tool that's available for you that enables you to have the kinds of information that will, will get you to the next level with your social and emotional skills and learning for kids. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and turn the mic back to Lori, and I think she's going to, to tee up Paul, um, and there may be some time, I believe, for some questions. So thank you again for attending. I hope this was a benefit to you. There's a lot of information to understand. Um, hopefully it tweaks your uh, interest and gives you a few ideas and, and will send you out uh, looking for more, for more answers for the questions that you have. Thank you again. Great, Cheryl. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I'll give you just a couple of moments to catch your breath and then we'll take some Q&A from our attendees. So if you do have a question for Cheryl, um, please feel free to submit it now through that questions box of GoToWebinar. We'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can. This webinar has been brought to you free today thanks to our sponsor, Apperson. School-based SEL programs are based on the idea that a student's academic success is linked to their ability to manage and regulate emotions, communicate, and solve problems and manage interpersonal conflicts. Now, social and emotional learning has been proven to decrease disruptive behavior, noncompliance, aggression, and disciplinary referrals. Technology offers tools that facilitate new ways to assess student learning. Apperson's Evo Social and Emotional Learning Assessment is a cloud-based version of the Devereux Student Strengths Assessment, a two-part screener and assessment designed to help educators promote social-emotional development of students. It includes the DESA Mini, which is used 
used to screen students and the DESA, which is administered to students who are identified as at risk for social emotional difficulties. So thanks to Apperson for sponsoring our sessions today. All our sessions are free and open to the public thanks to our friends at Apperson. Also wanted to take a moment to pop back into the teacher learning community here at simplek12.com, share with you where you can find some additional resources if you'd like to learn more. Underneath our courses tab, we're gonna go ahead and scroll through these categories of content here. We're gonna scroll down to learning theories and strategies. We currently have over 40 unique webinars specific to um, learning theories and strategies inside of the teacher learning community. There are 30-minute webinar recordings um, available to you. Great place to find some additional resources if you'd like to learn more. Also had several questions coming in about how to go in and watch the recordings of today's sessions on demand. Super for easy for every full access member here at Simple K-12. When you log on to simplek12.com, you'll see the webinars tab. We'll click on the webinars tab. And then the next step is going to be the on-demand tab. Now, it will take 48 hours um, for this webinar to become archived, but you'll see it listed here. They'll be listed chronologically. Um, if you have that full access membership, you'll be able to go in and watch those webinar recordings on demand as many times as you would like from wherever you may be. I'm just gonna open one here for you. Remember, if you have that full access member membership, you can make these presentations full screen. So when you go back to watch them on demand, you can make them full screen. You can fast forward. So if there's one particular portion of the webinar that you wanted to see, you can skip over um, the rest of that information and go to what exactly you want to see in the webinar. And I love it because you can pause. So if you want to uh, grab a snack, let the dog out, you can come back and that webinar is going to be waiting for you. Um, right where you left off. And I love being here with all of you live, but let's be honest, it's just more convenient to be able to go in and watch those webinar recordings on demand as many times as you would like um, from wherever you may be. Now we do have a very special offer for our attendees today, 50% off of our full access membership training package. And I can stay on for a few minutes at the end of our session, answer any questions that you may have um, regarding those full access memberships or um, about Simple K-12 in general. Okay, Cheryl, I've got your contact information up here on my screen. Did have um, a few questions coming in here. Question from Nancy, she said, which SEL programs are best for high school students? That's a great question. Uh, can you hear me, is my mic back on? Yes, Cheryl. Great. Um, you know, I th what I'm going to suggest is that you look at the CASEL website. They have recommendations. And, you know, in terms of what's best or not best, it's, it really depends on what the science is that, that proves that they make a difference. I think that's really important to look for programs that have been researched and that are based on solid research so that you know that if you do this program, it's, it's likely to have good outcomes. And then to try to preview based on your own needs. There are many school uh, programs available for high school students, not as many as for elementary through middle, I will say. Um, but there are some really good ones available, and I think it really has to do with your own personal needs. So I strongly suggest that you look at the CASEL website for suggestions of um, their, their best programs that they provide uh, information on. Okay, great, Cheryl. I um, did have a couple of more questions here for you. Um, next question came in from Sherry. She said, your presentation began with you talking about how you and other teachers and staff collaborated to help one troubled young man overcome emotional and social challenges. How would you address a classroom full of such students? I think it starts with having a vision for what you want to do. And I will tell you that the resources of parents are very important to help too. Now I know engaging parents is often a challenge, but if you can begin to have a vision for how you want to have a caring environment within your classroom, um, I believe it starts with a vision. And the second step is it also starts with you. Um, to make sure that everything that you're modeling, kids learn, as we know from watching teachers, um, to really uh, reflecting on what they're seeing and how it's being demonstrated. And the other place to start is with good information. Um, Paul is going to talk about, the, in, a, in his next presentation, our tool that really gives you a profile of your students and where their strengths are, 
as well as their areas of instructional need. Oftentimes, if we can start to build from strengths, that's the best entry point. So get a good profile of where your kids are at, a relative to, start, to social and emotional skills, and then find a starting place. We have great resources that are associated with the DESA, and I think you'll find that there are strategies that would support any entry point that you want to take based on the profile that you have of your kids. Uh, it starts with understanding who's really in your classroom, and sometimes we're actually very surprised when we use uh, the measurement tool of the DESA, we actually discover oftentimes strengths in children that we thought weren't there, that we sort of had this, this uh, uh, profile of them as being having such difficulties. But um, there are strengths with every child, and I think it starts with really identifying what those are and how we build on them. What, that's what we did with Scott, is we started with his strengths and his needs, and we really built on that. I think that's the important piece. Okay, great. Um, Cheryl, I think we have time for one more question here. came in from Stephanie. She said, what are some strategies that you would suggest using with staff to help address adult beliefs around SEL and shifting the culture slash climate of the school to recognize the importance of SEL? Well, that's a great question, and I think we're probably going to get into that. I'm going to encourage you to, to attend our last webinar, which talks about really kind of building that school-wide system. It starts, I believe, with the leadership at the top. Um, oftentimes, uh, what we say we want to have done as, an, as administrators or school leaders is not what we put our focus on and prioritize. So it, it begins with... Um, prioritizing that this is an important area that we know is for all of us. And it also begins with our own self-understanding. So doing some self-reflection, again, in our materials that we offer, we have uh, self-reflection, adult reflection uh, materials available so that you can actually begin to think about where are we um, individually and then taking a look at perhaps some school climate surveys there are many surveys that are available that will give you a read. And letting the data inform you, I think it's important to really get in the mindset of saying, how can we look realistically at what's happening right now and um, begin to think about what's our vision for, for what we want. Um, I believe in my heart that all educators really come to the classroom and to the schoolhouse with that in mind. And sometimes we don't have permission or sometimes we are overwhelmed. So a lot of it is making the intentional uh, time aside to say this is important. We're going to understand it. You know, create a learning community within your school to just understand it at a deeper level. And use that journey as a starting place for your own exploration uh, individually and as a group. Great, Cheryl. Thank you again for a wonderful presentation. It's been a pleasure being here with you today, as always. I look forward to being here with you again uh, later on this afternoon. Thank you very much, Laurie. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks again, Cheryl.